Hello, everyone, and welcome to this edition of AFTD's Healthcare Professional Educational Webinar Series. Today, we're going to be talking about person-centered care for FTD movement disorders, corticobasal syndrome, and progressive supranocular palsy, understanding and managing symptoms, and providing supportive care. My name is Esther Kane, and I am AFTD's Director of Support and Education. On behalf of everyone here, thank you for joining us. We're going to begin the webinar in a couple of minutes, but first I'd like to share a few housekeeping items and AFTD information. Please note that our audience will be muted for the duration of this webinar. This helps to keep the background noise to a minimum so that everyone can hear the presenter clearly. If you have any technical issues, please write a message in the questions box and we will try to address them with you. There should be time for Q&A at the end of the presentation. If you have a question for one of our presenters, type it into the questions box when you think of it. You don't need to wait until the end of the presentation to submit your question. We will answer as many of them as time permits. Additionally, this webinar will be recorded and archived for later viewing on both AFTD's YouTube page. I have some updates from AFTD. First, I highly encourage you to visit our website at the AFTD.org. Our website includes regularly updated and professionally vetted information about all the FTD disorders, including sections devoted to both corticobasal syndrome and progressive supranocular palsy. If you are looking for more information about these diseases, our website should be your first stop. Our next education conference will be held on May 5th in downtown St. Louis, Missouri. This annual event convenes persons affected by FTD, experts in the field, and other healthcare professionals for a full day of learning and connection. If you can't make it to St. Louis, you will be able to watch along online with our free live stream. Registration will open in January. If you want to receive an email alert when that happens, visit the URL shown on the screen and sign up. Whether you join us in person or via live stream, we hope to see you there. AFTD is your top source of information about all forms of FTD. Here are some ways you can stay connected with us. If you are treating someone with FTD and have any specific questions, we encourage you to email or call the AFTD helpline. Trained professionals will be happy to provide the information you need. Finally, we encourage you to sign up for AFTD's newsletters to get the latest developments in the world of FTD. Scan the QR code on the screen for more information. One of AFTD's newsletters is specifically geared toward healthcare professionals. Each issue of our partners in FTD care takes a deep dive into a particular disorder or specific aspect of care. Recent issues have focused on transitioning to residential care, FTD genetics, and what families should know and do after getting a diagnosis. There are over 30 issues of partners in FTD care available by accessing the web address at the bottom of your screen. For more information about today's program, we are offering continuing education credits via Rush University for those watching this webinar live. This is part of AFTD's developing efforts to educate healthcare professionals on FTD and FTD care. At the conclusion of the program, you will receive an email with the CEC submission information. Please note, you have 10 days from the date of the activity to complete the evaluation and claim the credit. At the conclusion of this webinar, you should be able to list two common symptoms specific to each of the disorders, recognize two common treatments to manage disease symptoms, and describe three approaches that are effective to support patients and families. Additionally, there are materials related to this program located in the handouts box on your screen, along with information about Rush University CEC approval for this program. Before I introduce today's presenters, I'd like to ask our audience a question. Have you ever supported or cared for a person diagnosed with PSP or CBS? You can respond by clicking on the response that best matches your professional experience. I'll give everyone a few seconds to weigh in.
So some of you responded that you've cared for one for one person. Um, about 38 of you, a few people with this diagnosis. And about 38 of you said you've never supported someone with this diagnosis. So I hope today you're gonna to be able to learn more and have a better understanding of both of these disorders. Now I'd like to introduce you to today's presenters. Dr. David Coughlin is a board certified neurologist specializing in the diagnosis and treatment of movement disorders, such as Parkinson's disease, PSP, CBS dementia, with Lewy bodies and other movement disorders. He completed a fellowship in movement disorders and a master's degree in translational research at the hospital of the University of Pennsylvania, where he also did his neurology residency. Andriana Gonzalez is the social worker at the Parkinson and Other Movement Disorders Center at the University of California, San Diego. Adriana's work works collaboratively with the center team to meet the changing needs of people living with movement disorders and their families. As part of her work, she has developed a Latino outreach program and collaborated with support groups and community organiza organizations to provide education about Parkinson's disease, CBS, PSP, and MSA. And now I'm gonna turn things over to Dr. Coughlin. There I am. Okay, hopefully you guys can hear me now. Um, thank you for the opportunity to come and talk to you guys. So um, thank you for the kind and accurate introduction. I am a movement disorders neurologist and I do spend a fair amount of time helping to treat patients who have these conditions. And we're gonna talk a little bit today about some of the common core features of uh, progressive supranuclear palsy, PSP, and cortical basal syndrome. And then we'll talk a little bit about some of the treatment options that are out there. So I do not have any disclosures that are relevant to this talk. My current research funding is through the NIH. Uh, we will be talking about the off-label use of medications because there's really not any FDA approved uh, medications for the symptomatic treatment of symptoms that are associated with these conditions right now. So within the umbrella of frontotemporal dementia, PSP and CBS falls under that uh, larger umbrella. And as you guys know, um, frontotemporal dementia includes many different subtypes, including behavioral variants, FTD, and the language disorders called primary progressive aphasia. But PSP and CBS are a little bit unique in that they have both movement disorders, features, and cognitive disorders. Um, that are associated with them. So under the umbrella of uh, Parkinsonism, these people will often be treated by movement disorders neurologists, and at least in our clinic, we view them as sort of a spectrum on the atypical Parkinsonian uh, realm anyway. So you think about regular Parkinson's disease, which is very common, but there are these handful of conditions that look a little bit like Parkinson's. They have some common features, but often they have some extra things as well that we're going to talk about today. So in our world, PSP and CBS, we treat them um, mostly in, from the realm of their movement disorders. But um, this depends a little bit on where you are uh, living and what kind of access to different subspecialty neurology care uh, might be available in your town or your nearby city anyway, but cognitive behavioral neurologists tend to treat frontotemporal dementia and movement disorders neurologists tend to treat Parkinsonism. So depending on who you are and where you are, you might be seeing different types of neurology subspecialists. And if you happen to be by a big city or something that has a large academic tertiary care center, it's actually not uncommon for our patients to see both. Um, I do refer many of my patients over to our cognitive uh, colleagues across the street anyway, and they can help with managing some of the features. So let's first start by talking about progressive supranuclear palsy. It's probably the most common of the atypical Parkinsonian diseases, and we think that it affects around six per 100,000 people. Most folks will tend to start exhibiting symptoms around their mid-60s, but there's a pretty substantial range. Um, I would say one comment though, it's pretty unusual for people to have symptoms that start below the age of 55. And if that happens, you might wanna question the diagnosis and do a deeper dive. Um, the mean survival from diagnosis tends to be about five years, but there's an extremely wide range around that average with some patients who do very well actually 
um, for more like a decade or a little longer, and some people who unfortunately get worse fairly fast. The core features of progressive supranuclear palsy, these folks tend to have very, very frequent falling because of problems with postural reflexes. Falls are often backwards, they kind of tip over, they'll flop backwards into a chair after they've gotten up. Little tiny pushes or missteps can lead to them tipping over almost like a tree. Um, there are also these core changes in eye movements, which gives the disease its name, the supranuclear gaze palsy. And this set of pictures at the right is a woman who has this condition. And what it's meant to show you is really that she has a fair amount of trouble looking up and looking down. Um, eyes just can't get all the way up and all the way down, but she's able to move her eyes left and right fairly well. Um, there's a couple other features just about her facial expression. Some people with PSP will also get this very surprised, um, sort of blank stare. Um, and this woman has this in the upper left panel. Um, other features that you will often see with this disease, people have often a fair amount of neck stiffness. They're generally quite slow. They'll develop a shuffling gait. They will have some Parkinsonism too. They can have a little bit of tremor. It's not a common feature, but it's not impossible to get a little bit of a pill rolling tremor with this. And people will often have changes in their speech, usually slurred speech and often some trouble swallowing within the first couple of years of the disease too. So I'm describing the movement symptoms, but as far as cognitive features go, patients will sometimes have fairly substantial word finding difficulties and will have these shorter sentences with a loss of grammar. Uh, I transcribed um, a very quick uh, audio file uh, with it was an example of, of somebody interviewing somebody who had this type of um, non-fluent aphasia and the, the transcript goes as follows, you know, the doctor asked, you know, what did you used to do for your job? And the patient says, um, well, I worked auto, auto, auto desk, seven, seven sales, very good. And physician asked, who is that sitting next to you? And he says, that's my, my, my wife. And this is a fairly severe example of it, but what you're meant to sort of take away with this is that, you know, this person made one error when they substituted the word seven for sales, but largely their answers were accurate, but they're very, very short. It's very, very effortful speech, it takes a lot to get out these single word frustrated. Um, and uh, because the sentences are so short, there's often not much grammatical structure to them anyway. Um, this is the hallmarks of sort of a non-fluent aphasia. As far as other non-language features that are cognitively associated with PSP, many patients are very impulsive. Um, getting up out of a chair to go grab something across the room. Um, some folks are very apathetic. You have to do a lot of prompting to get them uh, to, to do very basic tasks, even including bathing sometimes. And some of them will engage in socially inappropriate behavior. Um, there's sort of a category of other features that are a little bit movement, a little bit cognitive, a little bit other. Um, many people have these problems with their eyelids where they'll have very, very difficult excessive blinking uh, or have just trouble opening their eyes up. Some folks, in fact many, will have problems with bladder, uh, especially urinary frequency and urgency and really have to be close to a bathroom quite often. Uh, there's underreported issues with sleep disturbances, especially sleep fragmentation, being very, very tired throughout the day, even when they do get a good night's sleep. And many patients will have a lot of trouble. So the diagnosis of PSP is largely done on a clinical basis these days, even in 2022, but we do have a couple of tools that are at our disposal that can help augment the clinical exam and history that we do um, in our office. So um, in a PSP patient, if you get a standard MRI, uh, usually patients who are a little bit more advanced disease, you will see atrophy of this particular brain structure called the midbrain. And if it's small enough, um, the radiologist will sometimes call this a hummingbird sign. And what you're meant to see is, a, maybe you can see my pointer, uh, hopefully, but on this A panel anyway, that this brain stem uh, looks a little bit like a hummingbird, mostly because the spot up here has undergone a lot of atrophy, which is where some of the neurodegeneration in PSP takes place. Um, some other things that can help us make the diagnosis, um, DAT scans, which is a tool we often apply to Parkinson's disease, but actually is somewhat useful in PSP as well. You will see decrease in dopaminergic terminal uptake in patients with PSP. And the thing that hasn't quite made it to clinic yet, but is under research development, is many groups are starting to design better pet tracers, you know, 
amyloid PET has been around for a long time in Alzheimer's disease. There's even some tau tracers out there that work pretty well in Alzheimer's disease, but people have actually a handful of candidate tracers that work very well in PSP as well. And we'll see if any of them get developed uh, for far enough that um, they make it into clinic that we'll be able to use them to help diagnose people more accurately and earlier. All right, so what is actually happening in the brains of these people? Um, so if a person undergoes brain donation and we get a chance to look at their brain under the microscope, we see these abnormal accumulations of a protein called tau. And this happens in both neurons and also in white matter, including astroglial cells and oligodendral glial cells anyway. And these are some examples actually from my lab uh, with the top being these tufted astrocyte tau accumulations and the bottom showing these oligodendral glial coital bodies. And these tend to be uh, occupying certain fairly stereotyped brain uh, areas that is responsible for some of the symptoms that people um, notice during life as well. So now I wanna switch over to cortical basal syndrome. Um, it's probably the least common atypical Parkinsonism. Uh, we think it's probably less than one in 100,000 people probably have this. Age of onset's a little bit younger than PSP, tends to be 55, but again, there's a range. And similar to PSP, you know, survival averages about seven years, but there's a very wide uh, range around that average. Some people get worse really quickly, unfortunately, but there are some people who do well over 10 years of survival after a diagnosis. Core features of cortical basal syndrome is asymmetric Parkinsonism. One side of the body can be very stiff, very slow, and often there's this very notable dystonic hand posture. So the hand will like curl up almost, and on these panels are an example from an older paper anyway, showing uh, a handful of people with, with uh, CBS, cortical basal syndrome, where their hands were assuming these types of curled up postures. It can be painful for some folks. Other things that patients with CBS will sometimes have, the hand might sort of lift up on its own when the patient is not really conscious of it. This is called an alien limb phenomenon. Sometimes folks will have very quick uh, body jerks or hand jerks. This is a movement disorder problem called myoclonus. People have disorders of planned or learned movements, which we call apraxia, and gait and balance problems are very common as well, especially as the disease progresses. So we described a little bit of the motor symptoms, but there's plenty of cognitive symptoms to go along. Um, people will have trouble with calculations, difficulty with math. Um, they may have difficulty paying attention to one side of the body or the world. Uh, and the drawings that are done here on the bottom right were done by patients who have this particular problem, which we call neglect. You ask them to draw a clock and put all the numbers in the clock, and they're only really getting through halfway of the clock because they're not really paying attention to the left side of the world. Similar with their flower drawings, in this case, they're only really drawing the right half of the flower. Um, they can have the same language problems that people with PESP and non-fluent aphasias have, these shorter sentences, lack of grammar, and the same type of apathy and impulsivity can happen as well. They may also have the same problems with blinking, uh, bladder dysfunction, sleep issues, and drooling as well. This is to say that there is a fair amount of overlap uh, with some of the features of this disease with PSP too. So if you take an MRI from somebody who has uh, CBS, cortical basal syndrome, especially if they've had it for a while, the MRI will often show asymmetric atrophy on the other side that corresponds to the side that's got the worst Parkinsonism anyway, it tends to affect the frontal and parietal lobes and often it involves the motor cortex that can help us. Um, and FDG PET, which is a tool that's around now anyway, it can show this asymmetric brain metabolism, which goes along with the asymmetric Parkinsonism, and they're usually the one hand that's quite curled up as well. And similarly, like we talked about with PSP, if you look at the brains of these patients under the microscope, you also see these abnormal accumulations of tau. Sometimes you will hear PSP and CBS referred to together as these four are tauopathies. Although admittedly the tau is a little bit different in CB, uh, CBS than it is in PSP. Um, the, it's not really tufted astrocytes. You see something a little bit different called astrocytic plaques which uh, gives some specificity to the disease and makes us think that we might end up having to design um, unique treatments for cortical basal syndrome versus progressive supranuclear palsy. So let's do a little compare and contrast with Parkinson's disease. So 
what would make you suspect that somebody maybe has PSP or CVS as opposed to regular old Parkinson's disease? So I would say unusual motor features. So if somebody is falling very, very early, is having swallowing problems or very, very slurred speech within a year or two of a diagnosis, I'd be worried that person doesn't have Parkinson's disease and is trending towards maybe PSP. Certainly if you start noticing the eye movement changes and those core features of severe unilateral Parkinson's in there, dystonic posturing would be a pointer that you're dealing with cortical basal syndrome and not regular Parkinson's disease. Um, cognitive features. So, you know, we used to think that people with Parkinson's would have cognitive features problems a little bit later in the course of their disease. I think we're starting to appreciate more that that can happen at different uh, stages, but still um, apathy and impulsivity and the social inappropriateness, especially this very, very uh, prominent language issue, those would be unusual features for Parkinson's. That, if those were there, those would be sort of red flag features in my mind and be like, I'm a little bit worried that this person actually has a different disorder like PSP or CVS. Also progression. Um, PSP and CPS tends to move faster than PD, than Parkinson's disease. People's uh, stiffness and slowness tends to progress a lot faster, probably at least double the rate of an average Parkinson's patient. Uh, and if you have a patient in clinic who's already using a walker or a wheelchair within, say, five years of diagnosis without a good reason to be using one of those things, orthopedic injury or something, you're going to be a little bit worried that, hey, this person's moving a little too fast for Parkinson's disease. Maybe we're dealing with an atypical uh, Parkinson's like PSP or CPS. And unfortunately, a response to treatment. Uh, both uh, cortical basal syndrome and PSP tend to have a less robust response to levodopa than standard Parkinson's disease, where people tend to have a very good response that's usually sustained over many, many years. So let's talk a little bit more about treatment in that case. Unfortunately, um, there is no cure for either of these diseases and we don't actually have any uh, thing that really slows down progression of these diseases. However, we do have a handful of treatment options that can help treat the individualized symptoms that somebody may be experiencing with this. And you really do have to take a pretty broad approach, I think, with people who have these conditions to try to figure out exactly what is affecting them and potentially what symptomatic therapies you can offer. So you can really tailor make this uh, to help the person who's sitting in front of you. Regarding the treatment of Parkinsonism, I, you're really only stuck with carbidopa levodopa, which is the standard medicine in Parkinson's disease. It's been around since the early 70s, it's extremely safe, tons of safety data. You can take it for decades and it doesn't do anything bad to your heart, liver, kidneys, lungs. We're very spoiled, it's a very safe medication. And even though the responses to levodopa are not typically as robust as you would see in a regular PD patient, at least a third of people will have demonstrable improvements in their stiffness and slowness, and that's been demonstrated over a couple of different articles. Um, some patients can even develop extra movements, dyskinesias, which is something we often see with Parkinson's patients. It's not impossible to get that with PSB2. Um, typically, we don't recommend trialing things like dopamine agonists or other Parkinson's medications for these conditions. Uh, the side effect profiles are just not favorable, and you're a lot less likely to get um, even a little bit of a response with some of the other dopamine agonists, for example. Um, so we tend to stick to levodopa for working to try to get as much as we can to treat the Parkinson's aspect. So as far as limb dystonia, which is something that you will get in PSP and cervical dystonia, which you can get in PSP, um, we can do Botox injections actually. So if the hand is very curled up or flexed this way, you may end up trying to loosen up those muscles with uh, Botox injections to so those extremely tight and overactive muscles. Um, people with uh, PSP will often get this very, very stiff neck that kind of moves backwards a little bit. You can loosen that up a little bit with posterior neck injections too. The goal being to decrease pain improve flexibility. Um, bladder dysfunction from spastic bladder that's associated with both of these things. Um, there's a couple of medications out there, uh, Mirabegron and uh, Solanefesin. Uh, they tend to work pretty well for this. We do caution against using a lot of other bladder medications because many of those have some anticholinergic effects and can worsen cognition. So we're trying to keep it to some of these other safer versions of bladder medications. And as far as gait disorders and balance, we really try to work a lot with our physical therapists um, and trying to get people more strategies for walking and getting around their home safely. 
we tend to uh, advocate for the use of heavy wheeled walkers. You want something kind of heavy uh, to help make sure that you're not going to tip over when you negotiate around town. Um, there's at least one or two articles that uh, suggested that another medication, amantadine, could be helpful for the walking and balance aspect. I'd say that some people will use this in clinical practice. Um, it can cause a little bit of cognitive fuzziness and leg swelling, so you have to kind of weigh risks and benefits if you're going to try that medication, but it's out there. For swallowing dysfunction and dysarthria, we really spend a lot of time working with our speech therapists. Sometimes they'll assess speech formally through a barium swallow anyway, and, and they will often offer tips and tricks to help people eat and swallow safely, and sometimes even suggest modifications to the diet to be able to do that. Um, drooling. We can also do Botox for drooling. Actually, um, if you do injections to parotid glands or submandibular glands, it dries out the mouth just a little bit anyway. Um, but you do have to be careful if somebody's having some trouble swallowing, you might want to use lower doses or keep it to some of the parotid injections to lower the likelihood of making that problem worse anyway. Um, not everybody will do this, but atropine sublingual drops uh, can be helpful in, dry, in drying out the mouth if drooling is a very bad problem. Usually that has to be administered by a caregiver. Um, because you don't want to overdo it with the atropine drops because you can make people a little bit cognitively fuzzy if you use too much. Um, for depression, which is unfortunately a common feature of both of these diseases, um, classical regular SSRIs like Zoloft, Sertraline, uh, SNRIs, they're all very acceptable. Um, an older tricyclic um, antidepressant amitriptyline may improve the Parkinsonism that's associated with this in a couple of studies. Um, and sleep disorders for people with fragmented sleep. Um, you can use melatonin or trazodone. Those are usually pretty straightforward to work with. Um, one aspect that I didn't really mention, pseudobulbar affect. Some patients, in fact many I think actually, will have this very, very easy laughing and very, very easy crying feature to their disease. Um, and sometimes that's very disturbing to family members and patients alike. Um, there is a particular set of medications that can help that, dextromethorphan quinidine. Uh, which is out there, uh, really helps with that problem anyway. It can be a little bit expensive, but it is an option. And regarding blepharospasm or eyelid opening apraxia, you can do, uh, again, botulinum toxin injections around the eyelids to help loosen the eyes just a little bit to less, lessen the, uh, the blepharospasm that they have. But for folks who have photophobia, dry eyes, and blurry vision issues anyway, you many patients are often using either eye drops, eye lubricants, sometimes sunglasses are even needed to cut down on the photophobia if people find that the, the light is really bothering them. Um, home safety concerns. Uh, occupational therapists really help. Uh, they come out and can do home safety evaluations to help people manage their activities of daily living. And ultimately, goals of care. I think that it's very important to have frequent discussions with your neurologist and sometimes even palliative care specialists about which medical invention, interventions are really in line um, uh, with your particular wants and needs as the disease changes anyway. So all of that can be facilitated by your neurologist as well. That is the end of my presentation. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now, but I'm happy to take questions later on also. Thank you, Dr. Kaufman. At this point, I'd like to ask our audience another polling question. Now that you've heard Dr. Kaufman talk about PSP and CBS, what symptoms of these disorders do you think would be most troubling for families? I'll give you a few seconds to choose your response. Right. And it looks like about 66% of you thought that cognitive symptoms would be the most troublesome. Um, so we're going to hear now from Adriana Gonzalez and hear what she thinks are most troublesome for families and get an idea as to her um, perception. Just hold on one second because I have to share my PowerPoint for her. Dr. Gonzalez, go ahead. Thank you, Esther. And I don't see the PowerPoint up, so I don't know if anybody else can see it or not see it. I can see your desktop. Oh, there we go. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. I'm Adriana Gonzalez. I'm a social worker and 
I work also at UCSD with Dr. Coughlin, and I'm really excited to be here with all of you and talk a little bit about care beyond the clinic and kind of what that means for these particular patients, but also uh, recognizing that we all work within different types of clinics and we all might have a different role. So supportive care might mean different things to different people. And so I wanted to break it down just a little bit so that you can see what some of the interventions are and maybe you're already doing some of them or there's ways to incorporate them into your clinic setting. So I'll describe the role of supportive care and also identify three supportive care interventions that can be helpful when working with people living with these neurodegenerative disorders and their families. Next slide, thank you. And so I like to talk, I like to always start with talking about the team approach. And I, I think it's mo mainly because I have the privilege of working within an interdisciplinary team with Dr. Coughlin and a few other movement disorder specialists. So we really have seen how this team approach benefits our patients who have such complex symptom management needs because it helps support with communication, it helps with education, really giving people information about these disorders that they might not know about and, and supporting them and figuring out what's gonna work for them, really uh, making sure that the resources that we are providing are individualized and that it makes sense to this person and to this family. But really most important with the team approach is that we're assessing all of the areas of need physical, emotional, and social. And so this is just an example of some of the people who might be on the team. And I recognize that some of you might not work on an interdisciplinary team based on the clinic setting that you're on or if you're in a community environment. And so for those of us who might not work within a structured team, I think it's still important to take a step back and to look at all of the different professionals that our patient may be interfacing with how many different specialists they might have, and see is there a way for us to bridge that gap of communication or support, or just to provide some compassion and empathy for some of these patients who might be navigating so many different healthcare systems. Because as we know, it can be really complex, our healthcare system. And so it's just a way to recognize that this person may be interacting with all of these different systems and how can we better support each other to meet the needs of the patient and their family. Because as you can imagine, our patients and their families who are navigating these neurodegenerative disorders are experiencing a lot of different challenges. They're sitting with uncertainty. They are fearing their loss of independence and control and also experiencing a loss of independence and control. There's a lot of shame and isolation that can come or feelings of shame and isolation that can come due to some of the symptoms. I've had people tell me, you know, I don't wanna go out and meet with friends anymore because of my speech issues, uh, because it's embarrassing or because of my instability. It, people might think I look drunk if they see me kind of a little bit wobbly. And I don't wanna have to explain to people about my medical, my medical condition. Uh, there's a loss of sense of identity, people really feeling like, what does this mean for me now moving forward? And a change in the role in the family. A big one that I see a lot in the work that I do is worries about the impact that their disease and progression is gonna have on their family, which is, is further kind of complicated with having to make decisions about care. What is it gonna look like as this disease progresses? Acknowledging that it will over time. And so when I think about supportive care, it is so broad because I know, you know, for our audience, it might be you're a nurse or a social worker, even, you know, LVNs. And so, so many different types of allied health professionals, we all are going to work in different roles. And even two social workers may be working in two similar clinics, but have a completely different role. And so I wanted to show kind of a broad example of what supportive care can look like and really hope that some of this resonates with some of you so that you can see it, what, in which ways can I help support these families and these um, individuals who are diagnosed with these diagnoses uh, because it can be hard. As Dr. Coughlin mentioned, you know, these are complex uh, diseases with complex symptoms. 
and there is no absolutes about what it's going to look like. So we're navigating a lot of different changes and adapting along the way. And that goes for us too as providers. And so it really starts with a comprehensive needs assessment. And when I talk about a needs assessment, sometimes I think about when I went to school for social work, where that's a 45 minutes to an hour interview to get all of this great information. Well, the reality is most of us don't have that much time. So it's really about utilizing that lens to get snippets of what's going on and how somebody is doing so that we can put this puzzle together slowly. And so really thinking about how is this person adjusting to their illness? Are there any quality of life issues? And what does their family and social support look like? So it can be as we're walking them into their room asking about, you know, who brought you here today? Oh, did they want to participate in the medical visit? So just starting to kind of check those those different areas and just filing them away uh, and documenting that so that we could have something to build on. For some of us who might be in a more therapeutic setting, we are going to provide we are going to sometimes provide supportive counseling. That's part of our role, that's part of the intervention to, to provide these individuals with strategies for coping with crisis intervention because things can shift from one month to the next that someone's care needs can change. And really knowing our community resources. I think a big part of working with patients that have neurological disorders is knowing who's available knowing what resources are out there, acknowledging that we can't do it all, and recognizing that we ha might have some local resources that can provide some support, and there's also national organizations that can provide some support. So everybody has a role in supporting these families as they navigate these changes. A big one that so many of us, no matter our role, whether we're the person at the front checking the patient in or the movement disorder specialist, we can talk about advanced care planning we can ask somebody, do you have an advanced healthcare directive? And the answer might be, is, the answer is only gonna be either yes or no. And if it's yes, then oh, great, can you bring it in next time so we can upload it into your medical record? And if it's no, then that's an opportunity for us to remind these families, well, we ask every single patient who comes through our doors if they have one, because it's really important that we all have an advanced healthcare directive. And I'm going to put some information in the AVS for you on a link where you can explore. So it isn't about having them fill it out in that moment, but really initiating the conversation. The family and caregiver, it's really important that we assess how they're doing. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in the next couple of slides. But it can be just reminding them that there's support groups, maybe that there's respite care available if that is available where you are, and talking about self-care. Communication, so as we kind of talked about, so complex, people may be seeing different specialists within their, for their symptoms. And so that can be very overwhelming. And sometimes as allied health professionals, as part of the supportive care team, that is a, a, an area in which we can um, support people and lessen their anxiety by providing information on how to get in touch with that specialist and, and again bridging that bridging that um, gap so that they have access to the care that they need and education so the more we know about these diseases and about the symptoms and about strategies and resources the more we can provide them with that information so that patients and families feel better equipped with the information to navigate all of these challenges and transitions in care if we are seeing patients long enough, we are going to be there with them as they navigate transitions in care, whether that's hiring in-home caregivers or asking more family members to help out or thinking about assisted living and if that's an option or skilled nursing, uh, talking about palliative care, if we have access to a palliative care clinic so that people can really document their goals of their care and in, in our or patients who are advanced into the end of life stage of their disease, talking about hospice and having conversations about what does end of life care look like for you and how do we support you to get access to that resource. And I really pull out the caregiver and support network because as you can imagine, and as so some of you already 
kind of wisely chose that most caregivers are going to find the cognitive symptoms the most challenging to navigate. Engaging the caregiver in the support network starts from the beginning because as you can anticipate, as this disease progresses, so is the need for care. And managing things like impulse can get really difficult because that means that somebody needs 24 7 care maybe right it means that if I turn my back my loved one might get up and fall because they're impulsive and that kind of um, worry really weighs down on our caregivers but if we can engage them from the beginning and build a relationship we can kind of um, support them along the way to what I call build their foundation of support. And so starting with family-centered questions when there is a family member in the room, how would you describe your loved one? What would you want us to know about them that we wouldn't find in the medical record? That thorough assessment of their needs, which can be a question like, how has this all been for you? What does your support look like? Are there other family members or support or support people who should be invited to our visits. And again, education is key with all of this along the way. And it's also them educating us on what this disease looks like at home, you know, right? We only see this patient maybe 20 to 30 minutes every three or six months. And so what they are seeing at home is really key. And we wanna invite them into this process and into this relationship with our medical team. So questions like, what have you noticed about their disease and progression? Those are all ways to engage our caregiver and the support network, not only in um, to build a relationship, but to also get information that's going to be key to provide quality care. Because as you can imagine, the caregiver and the family experience can be equally as challenging as what their loved one is experiencing. We have so many caregivers who experience physical symptoms like fatigue and sleep and pain. They have uh, mental health issues like depression, anxiety, some which are situational, just based on caregiver stress and burnout, but some that have a history. And so now these symptoms are exacerbated by their current situation. I think the emotional well being of our caregivers is challenged every day. They might be experiencing feelings of guilt of anger, of ambiguous loss, and, and don't know where to put that or if that's even right to feel that way. And, you know, I never underestimate the overwhelming financial stress and how that impacts our well-being. The cost of care is just astronomical and a huge barrier to wellness for our caregivers. And the loss of income, as Dr. Coughlin mentioned, some of these patients um, who are diagnosed with these disorders are in their 60s, mid 60s. And so maybe they had to retire sooner they, than they planned to. And maybe their spouse had to retire sooner than they planned to. And so that can create a loss of income and a loss of anticipated income that can create a lot of stress for our family systems. And so what do the resources look like? And that, and that really goes back to this reminder that each person's disease, their symptoms, and their progression is going to be unique and unique to them. And we don't know quite what it's going to look like until we're in it. So as allied health professionals, as professionals providing supportive care, it really becomes about getting to know what's what the symptoms are most bothersome to this individual person and getting to know their individual needs. So this individualized care treatment is really gonna be person-centered because everybody is so different in the way they're navigating their disease and in the resources that they have available to them. And so I always kind of talk about resources very broadly because it's important to know that Resource packets are great, and when you're short on time, you give the resource packet and people have time to go through. But really taking the time to, to figure out in this moment what's the most challenging and then really directing people to specific resources, I think, is a little more helpful, it's, uh, it's particularly in these diseases where things can change and really take a turn that people weren't anticipating. So some, some big ones that I like to make sure people have are the support groups. 
are the respite, knowing if I have a respite care program in my city, in my county, so that people have access to that. And if it has a waiting list so that people can anticipate that need just a tiny bit. Uh, making sure that I'm normalizing uh, therapy and that we're talking about, you know, therapies can, can be utilized to um, deal with situational uh, anxiety and situ situational depression and these symptoms that you're experiencing and can help see you through to the other side because there there is no cure and we're going to continue progressing so let's get you some foundation some support to help navigate and help move you through um, having short list of your in-home care agencies that are local as dr Colbin mentioned having those relationships with physical and occupational and speech therapy and any home health teams never underestimate the power of someone's faith community so sometimes some people have a very strong faith community and reminding them to um, lean into those and to ask for help from their faith community and there's people who have some existential distress about their faith they have questions about why why is this happening to me and so opening that door and having the resources to then guide them either to a chaplain or to other types of resources that might help them explore their spirituality can be really life-changing for some of our patients. And then for family, really giving them tools to practice self-care, giving them tips on how to communicate with other family members and reminding them that you know now is the time to involve other family members. Let's do it before you need, before we hit a crisis point. Let's get people involved, get them to understand what this disease may look like in the future so that we know kind of what, what types of support we're working with. So for me, what's really important kind of takeaways is that supportive care can look different depending on the clinic setting that you're in. Everyone on the team plays a role in identifying care needs. So that's a great part of a team is that we can kind of communicate what we see from our distinct lenses of what some of the needs are. But most importantly, my biggest takeaway is really engaging family and support network is key when working with uh, people living with CBS and PSP. Thank you. Wonderful. And now, Dr. Coughlin, I'm going to invite you to come back on screen also, because we have a few questions from our audience, and maybe you guys can answer. You both did a fabulous job. I really appreciated your uh, person-centered approach, Adriana, and really um, noticing the person and the needs of the person and tailoring their care plan around their specific issues that are occurring for them. And Dr. Coughlin, your explanation of PSP and CBS was wonderful. But a question that came up was, what is the difference between CBD and CBS? Can you explain? I think you're still muted. <laughs> All right, there we go. Oh, sorry, it's there a double go. thing to get unmuted. Um, yeah, so it's a good question. So, and you might actually get a little bit of a different answer depending on who you ask. So, critical basal syndrome, I think, is best applied to when you're talking about people and their symptoms that are in front of you. Um, critical basal degeneration is probably best applied to um, people who have neuropathological validation of that's the actual underlying pathology causing those symptoms. I didn't really have time to get into this today, but one thing that's very complicated about diagnosing and caring for these, these, these syndromes anyway is that there's multiple different um, underlying biological changes that can result in people looking very similar. Like if you have a person who has a cortical basal syndrome phenotype, very asymmetric Parkinsonism, a little bit of myoclonus, some cognitive features as well, there is a decent chance that that is true as uh, happens because of cortical basal degeneration, that those types of tau accumulations. But in a lot of the, like, the larger autopsy studies, there's a substantial number of people who look like that who also had atypical Alzheimer's pathology or even PSP pathology when they came to autopsy. So this is the disparate uh, nature of what a person can look like in front of you in clinic and what may actually be happening biologically. 
Um, this is a challenge for FTD in general, I mean, and definitely a challenge for CBS and, and ESP patients. And, and truthfully, it's a, one of the focuses of my own research is how do we get better at going beyond describing what people look like in the clinic and giving them names based on their symptoms? That's really good. It helps. But I think that we have to do better and back up a lot of that stuff with different types of biomarkers that tell us with greater certainty, like this person has a cortical basal syndrome, but it is due to this underlying biological process. And I think that's how we at least take one step to sort of being able to treat people better. That's a great answer. Thank you. It's very thorough and it touches on a lot of the issues that we see in FTD in general, in terms of diagnosis and then um, how people respond when they get the neuropathology report. So that was wonderful. Adriana, a question came for you about how do families respond when they think it's Parkinson's disease and then actually find out that it's a PSP or a CBD diagnosis um, with a different life progression um, and different symptoms that are occurring? You know, uh, as you can imagine, most people are devastated because they were devastated when they got their Parkinson's disease diagnosis because none of us want to um, confront any chronic health condition and when you hear progressive and when you hear no cure that's all very scary and so usually people kind of um, have adapted a little bit and like okay and have accepted and now we're in a new stage and when then that changes it's like they're starting all over again and I've had people say to me like oh I wish we could go back and it was now I wish I would have been grateful that I had Parkinson's because now this sounds worse um, and so it, it is really challenging for people to have, and it's very um, common for our patients to first be diagnosed with Parkinson's and then it be something else when we see some of these changes. And so for me in my role, it's really about kind of sitting with that with them and allowing them to be devastating, devastated. That's an appropriate reaction to a very scary change in diagnosis. And so my recommendation is allow people to sit with it and feel what they need to feel, and then take our time to talk through what some of the resources are and connect them to other people so that they start building a community. Yeah, thank you. Dr. Cochran, we had a question about um, neglect and whether neglect is actually seen in other neurodegenerative diseases or if it's pretty particular to corticobasal syndrome? So no, neglect is not specific to these syndromes. You will see it in a handful of other conditions as well. Um, it, it's, it has some localizing value. People tend to get neglect when they get damage to the part of the brain, the parietal lobe. And unfortunately, it doesn't really matter what's causing that damage. Um, so yes, PSP, corticobasal syndrome can cause it. Some atypical Alzheimer's pathologies will do it also. Um, we don't see it a ton in Parkinson's disease. You certainly see it after strokes, and if you get a stroke to that area also. So um, truthfully, while those tend to be areas that are affected in PSP and CBS, it is ultimately not specific, and you can see it in other instances as well. Yeah. Well, thank you. That's all the time we have for questions today. I really appreciate both of you coming and sharing and allowing us to learn more about CBS um, and CBD and PSP. I learned more today, which was wonderful. Um, and we're gonna go now to the rest of our slides. So many FTD clinical studies and trials are underway seeking participants. Studies include experimental treatments to target FTD symptoms, as well as potential disease-modifying treatments for people with sporadic and familial FTD. Studies also include naturalistic observational studies to map the course of FTD, and some studies do not require the participant to know their genetic status. So how can people living with FTD learn more about their, their research opportunities? The best way to engage your patients to get involved is to have them sign up at the FTD Disorders Registry by visiting ftdregistry.org. The registry provides one location to learn about research participation opportunities and share their stories to inform research design. Participants' personal information is never shared. 
You can also sign up for AFTD's newsletters at the AFTD.org to stay informed about emerging research opportunities and the progress being made in existing studies. The next webinar in the AFTD Healthcare Professional Educational Webinar Series is scheduled to take place in February 2023. Our featured speaker, Dr. Howard Rosen of the University of California, San Francisco, will talk about diagnosing behavioral variant FTD. Stay tuned to AFTD's website for more information. Thank you for joining us, and thanks again to Dr. Coughlin and Adriana for their informative presentation. Thanks also to Rush University for allowing us to offer continuing education credits for this webinar. If you have any additional questions or comments about today's presentation, please reach out to us. We would love to hear from you. Thank you and have a great day.